Welcome, John. Hi, Iona. It's good to be on. Yeah, it's lovely to finally talk to you after a few <laughs> scheduling issues, just which a, happens to me all the time. <laughs> <laughs> right, well, since I'm in Australia, it's quite common um, mm, to right. find it to, for it to be difficult to find a time. Mm -hmm. um, so, tell us a bit about Braver Angels. Um, maybe start by telling us uh, why you founded that organization and um, what what your aims are, and and then perhaps you could take us through um, a typical activity, like one of the red and blue workshops that you do. Sure, sure. Well, thank you very much, Iona. Um, now to well to clarify. So I am a national ambassador for Braver Angels. Um, the organization, and I've been with the organization and the community, which is really sort of a better word for it, um, since fairly early on. Uh, it got, it was uh, incorporated as, um, well, as, as a nonprofit entity in, I believe, the spring or summer of 2017, but it was effectively born in the e immediate aftermath of the 2016 election. I was not yet aware of the organization, but the story essentially is that um, David Blankenhorn, uh, formerly uh, founder of the Institute for American Values, which was really a sort of a cultural think tank, um, wondered in the aftermath of Election Day 2016, whether or not Americans could still actually find common ground, given how bitterly divided we were over Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton in that, in that cycle. He reached out to who later became a Braver Angels co-founder, uh, my colleague David Lapp, uh, in, in um, South Lebanon, Ohio, and they basically compared notes from, from South Lebanon, Ohio, where David Lapp was, to New York City, where David Blankenhorn was. What was the mood? And, you know, David Lapp tells the story, basically said, well, people are really, really happy um, here. It's all about hope and change. You know, the election of Donald Trump, whereas in New York City, people were ready to, you know, throw themselves um, off of bridges and whatnot. And so they uh, ultimately found a location in Ohio that had been split 50-50, Trump voters and Clinton voters, and engaging um, the third Brave Rangers co-founder, uh, Professor uh, Bill Doherty, professor of psychology from the University of Minnesota, and a renowned family therapist. He put together a structure for two days of guided engagement between about a dozen or so individuals who had just voted from, for Trump on the one hand and Clinton on the other hand from the same community to see if they could overcome the distrust and find human connection. And they did that in a way that produced some powerful stories, including a, a friendship that endures to this day uh, between an evangelical Christian and former small-town sheriff and construction worker named Greg Smith, who had just voted for Donald Trump, and a man named Kuyar Mustafi, uh, who was a leader of the local Democratic uh, Central Committee or County Party and who was also a Persian immigrant to America and a practicing Muslim. And uh, there's a uh, moment that comes out of that initial gathering where Greg begins to say something to Kuyar along the lines of, I can tell you my problem with Islam, not even liberalism, Islam, in four letters, I-S-I, -I, and before he could finish spelling it, Kuyar responded by saying, my friend, I know what you're going to say, but my religion has been hijacked by people who don't share my values. Um, can you think of anybody in your religion who, who doesn't share yours? And it wasn't hard for Greg to think of Christians who he felt lived in an unchristian way. And so at the end of the uh, of the workshop, which in this case spanned over about two and a half days or so, they made a mutual commitment not only to continue the work of bringing people together in political dialogues, uh, but for each the other to pay a visit um, to the other's place of worship, with Kuyar visiting, uh, committing to visit Greg's evangelical church, and Greg uh, committing to visit a service at Kuyar's mosque. And so um, NPR picked up that story and the fact that these events were, these workshops were were happening after that first one in late 2016, the original Better Angels crew got on a bus and acted as first responders up and down different parts of the Midwest, and the South, and the East Coast, going into small towns in some cases and counties and, and, and uh, different areas where people were dealing with acute matters of polarization, PTAs not being able to 
to function, families falling apart. Again, literally first responders to the problem of polarization. But in each area where the bus stopped, where they conducted workshops, they trained others to continue producing those in the aftermath. And that became the first wave of, of what was at the time better angels and what would become braver angels, uh, members and volunteers. Um, so to give you a little insight into what some of the programs look like, I should say that in those early days, there was really only one program. It was the Red Blue Workshop. Now, I think we probably have the better part of two dozen programs and offerings specifically aimed at facilitating this sort of intergroup contact, if you will. But that first workshop, which remains an important part of what we offer, uh, is one in which you take small groups of people from the right and from the left, or reds and blues, as we say in-house, uh, not uh, principally or immediately to debate or argue politics, but to speak from the vantage point of their own personal or lived experience, if you will, uh, with respect to why they see politics the way that they do. So it's literally the application of marriage counseling, basically, for the relationship between Republicans and Democrats. Mm -hmm. um, the session, which is now condensed to three and seven hour versions, um, but the session begins after each side introduces themselves with uh, two moderators that split the groups into two rooms um, and guides each group through an exercise of listing all of the negative and incorrect stereotypes that they believe the other side has about them. And so for American conservatives and people on the right, that list almost always starts with the other side says we're racist and maybe goes to they think we hate women or they think we hate science. And on the blue side, liberals and progressives, generally that list will start with something like, well, the other side thinks that we hate America or that we want the government to run everything, take people's rights, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so each side is uh, asked to sort of fill out a list of stereotypes, but then also, after doing so, to reflect on where there may be a kernel of truth in any of those given stereotypes. And so, mm -hmm. you know, Republicans and conservatives will generally say that, well, it is not racist to be conservative, uh, but too many, uh, it, it, is not, it is not racist to be conservative, but too many people who call themselves conservative also are racist or are, are friendly to racist views. And we should see to it that our movement is not hospitable to folks who think that way. Just as po folks on the blue side will very often say, well, you know, to be progressive is not to hate America. But there may be some among us who have grown so frustrated with the things that are wrong in this country that they've become cynical about even the good things in, in America. And, and we shouldn't let that predominate. In our movements. And so um, this is the sort of activity that is engaged in in this particular workshop. Um, but as I said, there's a wide roster of other activities that really focus on different parts of the civic anatomy, if you will. We have workshops geared towards helping people sort of regulate their internal dialogue towards people on the other side. When I see somebody wearing a MAGA cap or BLM shirt or with the case whatever the case may be, am I thinking in stereotypical terms about them? Or am I speaking from the place of some knowledge, some empathy, and appreciation for, for nuance? Uh, we have workshops aimed at directly sort of uh, helping people develop the constructive capacity for empathetic dialogue across partisan and ideological lines, so really just sort of showing you how to communicate across political divides. We have, of course, the Brave Rangers debate program, which is about debate, but really about sort of the communal pursuit of truth. It's not a win or lose debate. It's a community debate where anybody can speak. And the idea is that we don't just marshal facts and, and uh, information in our arguments, but we are also transparent about our personal experience with issues and where we might actually be uncertain uh, about some of what we believe uh, on a given topic, elevating intellectual humility as a part of the core mm. ethos of debate within Braver mm. Angels. And so that, that gives a sense of the range of the work we do in terms of citizen engagement, but there's much more that we do that is specific to institutions, specific to working with elected officials and government officials and candidates and educators, so on and so forth. Mm. I think it's really important work because on the one hand, um, it is, um, people tend to either, they get into very uh, ferocious arguments, or else they just avoid arguing, they just avoid talking politics altogether. So, you know, yesterday I was at choir practice and um, I was chatting to my neighbor and she said, oh, it's so cool that you work for a, a 
political commentary magazine. Um, I'm a candidate for the for the Greens, um, so I'm also a political person. <laughs> just thought, okay, <laughs> so I just said we're not. I think we will disagree on politics, but it doesn't matter to me. So we just didn't discuss politics, and of course that is um, um, that is that's fine on a. Uh, on a one-on-one -on -one personal basis, it's important to be able to have politics-free zones. But also, if we don't talk politics, we can't improve. Um, we can't improve society. We do yeah. that by testing our ideas against stress testing our, our ideas against other people who disagree, and being able to getting a clearer sense of what people want, so that we can have a better democratic. Uh, more accountable democratic um, system in which people are actually able to, their vote is actually giving them what they want, but in a way that isn't completely alienizing and oppressing those who didn't vote for it. Right. Um, mm -hmm. So I think yeah. it's a re really important um, thing that you do there. Yeah. Well, I, I think that that's, I think that that's right and well stated. Um, I think the, there's a fundamental appreciation of the nature of self-governance and participation in a liberal democratic society um, that is escaping our memory in the current moment, that it is part of the work of Braver Angels to reclaim and renew. But perhaps actually two fundamental truths. Uh, one fundamental truth is that the stability of our systems and our institutions rests not merely or even principally upon which political faction happens to predominate or hold office at a given period of time, but rather the health of the social fabric and our ability as people to remain, to retain, uh, if not ideally some affection, that at least uh, a certain baseline of respect and interpersonal trust such that we can actually engage in the project of self-government together, respecting the rules and not feeling ourselves in a zero-sum competition with enemies such that the rules are only useful insofar as they advance the power of one faction or the other. And then uh, built upon that, uh, a recognition of the twofold objectives, really, uh, of democratic participation, of which we really only remember one. The one that we remember, of course, is the competitive aspect of democratic politics. Of course, we all have things that we believe in, so in terms of cultural values, in terms of policy, uh, and we have our allegiance and convictions with respect to which party and candidates we ought to be voting for. And so democracy is, by its nature, conflictual in that way, and that's actually a good thing, ideally, that becomes the catalyst for compromise, innovation, and progress, and hopefully the living up to our deeper ideals. But at the same time, con competition obviously can give rise to the sort of conflict which is no longer constructive, but destructive. And therefore, even as we seek to win the next election cycle, we should also be just as concerned at all times with competing politically in a way that allows us to sustain the community um, that the concept of the social fabric represents. We have to engage in political competition in a way that maximizes uh, our ability to succeed, but not at the expense of maximizing our ability to live alongside. And that latter peace, I think we've taken for granted in certain circles of society long enough to where we are now in a position of realizing that we have to make a conscious effort as new straining factors uh, apply themselves rather fiercely to the stability of the larger body politic and our institutional landscape. We have to conscientiously discipline ourselves and dedicate ourselves to the craft of building and rebuilding intergroup trust again. And so Brave mm. Angels seeks to provide the tools by which that may be done. Mm. Yeah, you have to have buy-in from the losers. Um, mm. You can't, uh, you know, the idea of a liberal democracy is there are also some 
institutional checks and balances that mean it's not just a dictatorship of majority opinion. Um, right. But even though, even for people who disagree with you, you have to have a minimum amount of buy-in and goodwill from them for things mm -hmm. to function. Right. Um, Mm -hmm. Yeah, I yeah. think it's super important and, and not often enough talked about. Um, so you recently had the 2024 convention, which I gather <laughs> was quite uproarious. <laughs> Can you tell us about what happened there? Well, you know, it, it was um, it was uproarious at points. Um, it was emotional. It was poignant. It was also cerebral and intellectual and polemical. It was artistic and creative. Braver Angels conventions can be a little bit hard to describe because really um, Braver Angels mission and the sort of breadth of things that we engage in is a whole of society mission. It's, it's not actually, it, though it started here, it is not merely narrowly focused on the acute point of, of uh, cross-partisan discourse, although of course that mm -hmm. that is that is a central facet of our of our work, um, to be sure. But over the course of three days, uh, the Brave Angels Convention, twenty twenty four convention, which was in uh, at Carthage College in Kenosha, Wisconsin, uh, which of course was the site of some very uh, difficult uh, protests during the summer of twenty twenty, and you know people will people will uh, remember. Um, Actually, I say people will remember, but I'm forgetting the name of the young man who drove into Kenosha armed to mm -hmm. ward off BLM protesters and the controversies that ensued from that. But mm -hmm. um, we gathered um, as an even number of delegates, red, blue, along with a considerable number of independents and third party members uh, to one, engage in the work of re re uh, catalyzing uh and 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 refreshing our our own social relationships our own social bonds brave rangers is a membership organization we have about 13,000 or so members across the country about 100 or so local brave rangers alliances you think of them as local bipartisan chapters and so there are a lot of people coming together to see each other the national gathering who some are there for the first time but many are old friends going way back to 18 17 16 and so forth um we came together to do that. We also came together to participate in a series of policy debates as well as common ground workshops focused in on exploring the potential for cross-partisan consensus on four policy issue areas uh, specifically. One was was uh, the subject of abortion. The other uh, was the subject of free speech slash hate speech. The other was income uh inequality versus economic prosperity. And then there was also the subject of immigration. And the idea was that over the course of two and a half days uh, or so after having engaged in a wide range of, most of our delegates anyway, debates and common ground uh, workshop uh, discussions about these issues that the delegate body would vote on which one Brave Angels as a national organization would prioritize in terms of applying its energy to an ongoing consensus um, aimed uh, series of policy workshops that had been piloted in a preceding uh, project focused on electoral reform, which unfolded over the course of three years. It was 200, it was about 27 workshops in 26 states and 200 participants. And so that was part of it. Um, but also uh, to play music together, to sing together, uh, to put on some theater and some comedy. I wrote a comedy skit, you know, I sang multiple Fantastic. times at the convention. Wow, I come from a musical yeah. background. Yeah. So all know, of these yeah. things, yeah. So all of these things go into it. The, the one other thing I should mention, though, because it was completely new and unique to this convention, um, you know, we scheduled um, the dates for this year's convention, I think, well, it was sometime the latter half of last year. And, you know, I, I'm sure in in consideration of that, the, um, the Democratic and Republican with Biden and Trump campaigns decided to hold their Nash, their first and earliest ever presidential debate on the very same night uh, as the first night of our <laughs> convention when we just happened to be bringing you know, <laughs> Trump and Biden folks together from all over America. So we made the decision to, you know, in a sense, take advantage of that and hold what proved to be the largest bipartisan debate watch party in America, by any accounts, um, 
uh, on the night of the 27th when the debate was was airing. So it got a fair amount of media uh, attention. Uh, the the New York Times actually just just the day before you and I had this conversation, Iona. Uh, uploaded uh, an episode of their run-up podcast devoted specifically to the experience of delegates at that watch party. The the Washington Post is running an article about it and and others. Um, But it was an extraordinary thing because that debate was deeply challenging (laughs) for really just about all (laughs) of our folks to watch. I mean, you know, we've got Biden supporters, you know, we've got some Trump supporters and a lot of folks who, you know, are, are... you know, doggedly independent. Um, and, you know, while people had differing opinions on who was lying the most, <laughs> you know, I think that, you know, <laughs> the, the conduct of each candidate was concerning to to most of our delegates. And in that one very acute moment, of course, where Joe Biden rather crumbles in the beginning of the debate, I mean, it, to me, it, it felt like, it, it, it viscerally, felt like a, a shared a shared heartbreak for everybody in the room, even for those who are vehemently opposed to Joe Biden, just because of what this mm-hmm. moment and the larger debate signified with respect to where our shared country has come to, to what yeah. we've come yeah. to. You it's, know? The gerontocracy, yeah. it's amazing how yeah. uh, just how old both candidates are. Mm-hmm. Um, and in my opinion, they're both losing their marbles. Um mm. Yeah. yeah, yeah, right. Um, well, yeah, I think that many people agree with you, uh, to be to be certain. And um, you know, uh, I think furthermore, even if that weren't the case, but the the uh, the shallow sense of trust that we have in either of them and their intentions and their capacity to tell the truth, whether you think that you know one of those candidates or the other is much you know, more honorable than the other. I mean, you know, I, I try to, I, I'm, I'm always happy to share my opinions on that, but I generally don't go out of my way to volunteer them, just given my position. Mm-hmm. But um, it is it is a fact that democracy cannot effectively endure in the absence of trust between people, but also between people and their and their leaders. And if we've come to the point to where we feel that the next president of the United States or the current president of the United States is something of a dictator um, over American life or someone who aspires to that sort of corruption of power, um, it doesn't it doesn't bode well for where we're going. But what made the watch party uh, inspiring, what made the whole convention inspiring, was the fact that you had liberals and conservatives sort of holding each other through the, the, the recognition of that and thinking constructively about how we can be a part of the solution when it comes to reviving trust between the American people um, to begin with. Mm. Do you think that we are at a particularly polarized moment? I mean, it's very tempting always to think that your own moment is, a, is an especially polarized one. And I know that there have been moments in the past where America has been much more polarized than now, uh, during the Vietnam era, for example, um, the early civil rights era. Well, we can go all the way back to um, the, uh, the Civil War. Um, but I, I feel that in, uh, as far as recent years are concerned, within my kind of adult life, lifetime, uh, there has been a real escalation um, at least recently, there's been a real escalation to me because of, first of all, um, because of Trump's appearance on the scene and what a polarizing figure he has been. Mm. Um, and also because of the two major wars that are being fought at the moment, um, and uh, um, of which probably the war in Ukraine, the outcome of that is probably going to be more significant, but the war in Gaza is the one that is... Um, has captured people's imaginations and has has really, really polarized people in an in an ugly way that I haven't seen, I haven't mm. seen in uh, uh, looking quite so extreme across the board for for a while now I think. Um, yeah. But you know it's always tempting to think this is this is the kind of moment of maximum mm. polarization. Always tempting to think that I used to be a 
Uh, I guess uh, I was in the English literature department, but I was kind of also a historian because the work I was doing. And mm. it was a joke that we had that historians always say, well, my period was the important period when everything started mm. changing. <laughs> right, yeah. Yeah. Um, and people said that from, you know, um, from the Anglo-Saxon times right through to uh, post-World War II. Mm. Um, so, uh, yes. but how do you feel about, about the climate at the current moment yeah yeah well it is a bit of a a bit of a truism i suppose that your period is the period in which everything else winds up hinging there's always a bit of a vanity Mm. and bias towards the present moment and sort of you know being the the apex of whatever it feels like to you it certainly is the most polarized period in my lifetime i'm only 37 years old of course but Mm. um there are Get off my lawn. Right, right, exactly. Now, you know, uh, I do take your point in real terms about the comparison to Vietnam. Um, There are uh, acute metrics by which we really are more polarized uh, today than we were in uh, the 1960s. And, you know, they didn't really have polling as we have it today in the 1860s, but you would probably have to go back that far. Um, just with respect to partisan affiliation, I mean, there, there's polling uh, that showed that in the early 60s or so, um, you know, they asked Americans, uh, would you have an issue if your son or daughter married somebody of the opposing party? And, you know, the number of people who said that they would was marginal, somewhere in the 5% area, where about 50% of Americans would have had a real issue if their children had married someone of a different race or of a different religion, Catholic versus Protestant bias was still very strong mm. at that mm. at that time. Um, today, that is completely flipped, uh, and the figures indicate that cross partisan relationships uh, within families are, by and large, much more controversial um, for most Americans than would a interdenominational or an interracial marriage be. So you know there 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 are different. Uh, aspects to the larger landscape of American polarization. With respect to the straightforward question of our political culture and the functioning of our political institutions, you know, given the fact that the Democratic and the Republican parties, the only parties of consequence in, in, a, in a two-party system, effectively two-party system, given the fact that you know, sort of the social relationships that exist in our political institutions uh, are horizontally, you know, um, bound through these partisan inst- through these partisan institutions. There needs again to be some degree of fraternity, you know, between Republicans and Democrats that ultimately transcends their conflictual their their competitive interests. That's what's dwindling on on that level to virtually virtually nothing. So that's scary in and of itself. But it's also true, though, that, you know, while interracial marriage is much more common, while multiculturalism is a more established vein of American culture and ideology, that the way we think about racial realities has reached a new inflection point in terms of warring interpretations over whether or not we live in a systemically racist society, a white supremacist mm-hmm. society. Uh, these differing views, I mean, the funny thing is there's a multiracial coalition of people on either side of those <laughs> those questions, right? Um, which, again, shows, I mean, progress, really, <laughs> you know, I think. Um, but, you know, those sorts of issues have reached a new inflection point. Um, our religious culture, of course, has become more secular, less kind of traditionally rooted in the way it was before. But you do have, you know, the, the, the terminology of Christian nationalism hangs in the air, but you do have religious culture becoming politicized in a way toward the emotional fervency of religion. And this has been happening, you know, at least since the 70s and 80s, but in a resurgent sort of way. But the emotional fervor of religion has attached itself um, to political identity in a way to where the former is actually validated by the latter. And that cr- provides a tremendous cultural impetus 
towards the destruction of our social relationships. Because it's one thing for me to say that because you're a Democrat, you know, we disagree on on politics and, you know, uh, and I'm going to try and beat you in the election. It's another thing for me to say that because you're a Democrat, you're a sinner and your mortal soul even is in question and your victory can only be a victory for the literal forces of evil, right? Um, and so, you know, that sort of attitude has now, I think, reached a greater breadth within a large and significant subsection of the of the population, namely sort of the base of the Republican Party, even as so much of the base, or at least the vanguard of the base of the Democratic Party, would use similar language in saying that if you are at all not only right of center, but like, you know, maybe even right of well to the left, uh, you are varying shades of racist. And that is sort of the secular equivalent of, you know, kind of eternal condemnation, <laughs> you know, um, in, in the way our society has evolved. So all of these things have reached new inflection points against the backdrop of the changes in technology and media in America, which I think even, even in so far as there's significant organic polarization in American life, it is artificially inflamed in a massive way um, through the vehicles of these new technological platforms um, and the perverse incentives that guide the the business models of the political parties, but also the political media um, as well. So ours is, I think, a uniquely challenging moment, even if it is the case that, you know, by all sorts of metrics and maybe in, in real terms, you know, there are ways in which things were worse in the 1960s and certainly were worse in the 1860s. But it doesn't make the problem of today's polarization any less complicated to realize that. Yeah. I mean, of course, in Europe, we have another factor, which um, I, I say we in Australia, this is also an issue, uh, which right. you don't have in uh, in uh uh, in the U.S. In, in the same way or to the same degree by any means, which is the Muslim vote. So in Australia, there's a campaign at the moment to vote Muslim, vote, um, you know, get out the Muslim vote. Mm -hmm. And um, again, that is um, so using kind of religious fervor to create this intensely polarized and um, often, that shape, uh, often that moves very quickly towards extremist opinions. Mm. Um, and that's very different from having a devout personal belief. Um, this kind of leveraging of religion into politics is is um, is dangerous and to me totally illegitimate and very much goes against American uh, core American values. I I personally believe. Mm. You mean the the influx of particularly Muslim immigrants into European communities yeah, and I suppose Australia yeah. well, in a way no, that's changing are, sort of yeah. the value structure of, of politics yeah, and government in these places. Well, you know, uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah. So, you know, I, I only have a general familiarity with what you're describing just because my own work is so U.S. centric, but I do recognize mm -hmm. that um, there are ways in which these phenomena uh, are not, you know, there is an interconnection that exists here, a thread wherein, you know, of course, the United States of America is in the throes of its own immigration crisis. That's actually, that actually was the biggest issue in this election campaign up until a few moments ago when, you know, certain Supreme Court decisions came down and Joe Biden, uh, you know, seemed to sadly um, – somewhat lose his pulse in, in the last debate. Um, but immigration as a policy matter is the big is probably the biggest issue of concern in the country if you had to rate mm -hmm. them. It it is the one that we came uh, away uh, deciding to try and have an impact on uh, at the end of the Braver Angels convention. And while there's all sorts of valid and legitimate um interest in that issue relating to the sovereignty of our nation, the integrity of our borders, the rule of law, but also compassion uh, for people uh, who mm -hmm. are coming here seeking a better life, uh, aligning that with our sense of our own heritage as a nation of immigrants, uh, generally speaking, um, in, in, our, in our history. Um, but within all that, um, there is a tension between the fact that when you, you know, when enough immigrants come into a given place, when enough people who are not natives to that culture enter in, they do potentially change the fabric 
of a society in a way that catalyzes an identity crisis, uh, even 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 bef- even alongside the material uh, tensions that mm-hmm. come through that. Um, People are experiencing that or at least fear that as something that will sort of change the face of American society from a values and cultural perspective. Mm -hmm. But that looks enough like racism in the context of the history of a nation that at least in its founding, you know, I would express some sympathy for the anti-racist cohort of our of our country, at least in its founding, uh, was institutionally set forth in a way that did not protect the liberty of African Americans and, and Native people that uh, whose wealth uh, was in, ve- in certain ways, at least to some degree, derived from forced labor on the one hand and the acquisition of territory on the other. This legacy is behind us, and along with the very complicated history that followed those founding uh, moral catastrophes, colors every interpretation of the actions of America's political and governing institutions as they seem to be aimed against the interests of people of color to this day, right? Uh, And Mm -hmm. so there's a sense of guilt uh, within many quarters uh, of of America and a sense that, you know, we need to be as not just as welcoming and accommodating as possible, uh, but to perhaps redistribute power and influence in American society which is in keeping with the conscience of some people, but very much alarming to the conscience, conscience and the interests of of others. And I think that there's some similar psychological dynamics at play um, in Europe, in Australia, and in the United States. The main differentiator is the fact that the religious component is not as much of an issue in America's immigration problem. Mm-hmm. I mean, most yeah. people coming over yeah. from Latin America are Catholics and so forth. Doesn't represent the same tension, um, but mm-hmm. you know, the conversation still reaches us uh, in a vi- variety of ways, ways, and for a variety of reasons. So, mm-hmm. can somewhat relate. Yeah, I mm-hmm. think it's I think it's very different because the religious component is the most important and the most mm-hmm. controversial, and to me, also troubling aspect mm-hmm. of it. Of, of it here and also mm. in Europe. Um, and in the States, if anything, the religious, the religious influences, the call is coming from within the house. So the religious mm-hmm. influences still yeah. much more strongly evangelical Christians. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I, so you yourself, um, I just want to talk um, a, li- a, a, a tiny bit before we close about um about you personally, John, because I think your background is really fascinating. Mm. You are, um, you have been a bridge builder basically all your life, and um, <laughs> um, your own background has has fed into this. And I find it, for example, I love the fact that you say um, that you are just as much white as you are black, mm. um, mm-hmm. and. Also, it was your your white father was a major figure in promoting uh, black music, um, African American music, um, mm. because uh, through uh, his company Dot Records. Um, more, speci- more specifically, so my gr- my grandfather. Yes, mm-hmm. your grandfather. Sorry, mm-hmm. your grandfather. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so, could you talk a little bit about your own background, and upbringing, how that's how that's influenced you? Sure. Well. Um, I've, I've framed this a certain way across most of my career. Um, people who follow me much will <laughs> have heard me tell this story, but when I was a uh, nominee for Congress back in 2014, I was the youngest active nominee for Congress in the state at the time. I was Republican running against Maxine Waters, as a matter of fact. And, um, but I was campaigning in a district that, while predominantly left-leaning and black and brown, did have a pocket of white and also Asian conservatives living in a suburban portion of the district, largely inner city district otherwise. And so whether I was speaking to a black democratic-leaning church in South Central Los Angeles or to a white Tea Party club in South Bay Lake County, people would ask me, how can you, at the age of 26, represent a district as diverse or complicated as the California 43rd and 
I would answer uh, by saying, well, I have an interesting family background. My mother's a liberal black Democrat from inner city Los Angeles. My father's a conservative white Republican from Tennessee. I grew up explaining my father to my mother and my mother to my father. And that's why I can represent all of you. And so, you know, tended to be. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Mike Lee told me, <laughs> Senator Mike Lee told me, he said, that's the best line I have ever heard in politics. <laughs> so, uh, or the greatest opening line you've ha- ever heard. You had a myself. red and blue workshop going on at home. <laughs> well, yeah, now, the truth is, is that the nuances of my upbringing were a little bit more complicated than I made it seem. My dad was a registered mm-hmm. Democrat really up until the 2008 election, the Obama election, um, at which point he felt like the Democratic Party had left him completely behind. But dad was always sort of, uh, dad was always the conservative influence in my household, though, elementally. Um he raised me with an emphasis on traditional American values, although he didn't quite mean that in the way that your standard social conservative does. But nevertheless, my father thought that American culture on the whole was far stronger in the 1950s and the 1960s than it became in the 1990s and the 2000s. Um, he also raised me with a fair amount of a certain amount of Southern nostalgia, really. My father is from Tennessee originally. That's where the Wood family comes from. And, um, you know, there's a certain sort of romanticizing uh, of of home, of the land, of history, of country that attends to that. Uh, My dad raised me with stories of Davy Crockett and Daniel Boone, the Pioneers and the Alamo. And, you know, folks, some folks will understand these references. Um, And so, you know, that was kind of my dad's cultural influence at home while also being a uh, you know a white man born in the south who was deeply engrossed in in love with black culture and generally and black music uh, in in particular and admired folks like his heroes were folks like Muhammad Ali and Willie Mays you know among black athletes and so you know my dad uh, is an omni american sort of sort of guy in that in that sense um, but um, I had those strains of influence. Meanwhile, um, the really political people in my family were my father's uh, progressive sister, who was an activist in the 60s and was uh, going to school at Berkeley when Reagan sent in the troops to put down anti-Vietnam protests that left one of her friends killed in the process. Um, and then my my black mother's older brother, who was a was black conservative, was a Reagan conservative, and uh, was really the person sort of articulate. Yeah, he was behind the war. Uh, my, my uncle supported the war in Iraq, was a major uh, fan of George W. Bush at the time. And he was the voice of, of sort of the political right and of black conservatism in my family. So, you know, all of that was in the air politically. But um, my economic stratification, I mean, the, the sort of economic stratification of my upbringing was probably just as significant to me in the long run, this was the political and racial differences. I really had three native environments growing up. On the one hand, day to day, I lived in multicultural, middle-class uh, suburban Culver City, California. Went to the fourth most diverse school district in America. Um, but uh, on weekends, I would visit my mother's um, relatives who were in places like Inglewood and South Los Angeles, basically the inner city. Got used to jumping on the bus with my um, uncle, who was only a couple years older than me, my mom's baby brother. And, you know, we knew that there are certain neighborhoods that if we had the wrong colored uh, shoelaces on and we might not walk out the other <laughs> side of them. And we knew to be uh-huh. careful around the cops and so forth. But then over holidays, I would visit my father's parents uh, who um, were wealthy, not as wealthy as they had been in my father's youth, but they owned a multi-million dollar home in La Jolla, a very affluent coastal uh, community in mm-hmm. Southern California. They owned a uh, they owned a house with a million dollar view of the ocean, uh, not but a couple minutes away from Mitt Romney's house, the one with the car elevator that they that they used to talk about oh, yeah. in the 2012 election. Yeah. So I, I grew yeah. up bouncing Didn't back his, and forth. Um, wife um, had have MS or something. Yeah. Yes, she did. Sorry, right. Ahead, so ahead. it wasn't actually a luxury <laughs> thing. Uh, it, it literally just mm-hmm. made it easier for uh, for Ann Romney to to get to the car. But you know, people <laughs> people heard that. It, it didn't help Romney <laughs> be relatable. Um, of course, Romney was <laughs> a very different person from Trump uh, in that way. But my only point here is that I grew up not really traveling very far geographically. 
But socially, socioeconomically, uh, I had Native experiences that rooted me very much um, among the sort of urban poor, among the multicultural middle class, and within a, a very um, a very Anglo um, uh, upper class uh, community uh, is as well. And as time has gone along, it's the class differentiators that have been almost as impactful for me as anything else in understanding the deeper divisions that exist uh, between Americans. Thanks so much, John. What I really, one of the things I really like about you, so um, I'm, I'm going to mention this on air, you're a little bit more subdued than usual today because you do have a back injury. So you're, <laughs> thank you so much for soldiering on through that. Um, but pe people should go and take a look at some of your keynote uh, speeches because um, you are quite a a fiery and inspirational speaker. Mm. It's even reminding me of a tradition of sort of black Southern Baptist <laughs> preachers in, in a way, but the yeah, content yeah, sure. is completely mm -hmm. different. But the passion mm. is for um, the A Pluribus Unum, a vision mm. of America. Um, yeah. Together we are uh, from a multitude, uh, we are one. Mm. It's very yeah. inspiring. And mm. I think it's... Um, it's an important counter to people who feel that only religion, which is an inherently deeply polarizing thing, um, is the only thing that can can bring um, can bring kind of passion and inspire mm. people. Um, and I think you're wonderfully inspiring in a secular way, which is unusual and very valuable. Um, yeah, well, I appreciate that. If I could just make one render one comment on that observation mm. you know my, my principal role model and inspiration among historical figures is martin luther king jr dr reverend martin luther king jr and certainly he was speaking himself out of religion religious context and you know i do i have given us more than a couple sermons in my time and so the black church connection is <laughs> it is there for me too <laughs> but what made i think king able to transcend mere kind of religious parochialism, if you will, in his uh, in his social activism was the fact that he was tapping into some foundational religious principles drawn from Christianity, but also, of course, the teachings of Gandhi and the philosophy of nonviolence that I think arrived at some sense of human values that was much more universal than any one tradition. You know, Dr. King's philosophy of nonviolence was rooted in the idea that love is a spiritual force that can affect social transformation. But you didn't actually have to be, although he spoke to a black uh, community that was rooted in the church in the South in particular, and though he used that language to engage the conscience of you know Southern whites who might have been evangelical segregationists, Nevertheless, he tapped into a moral language that transcended all of those categories and spoke to the conscience of, of, of North, secular white northerners and people on the coasts and people from far outside of Jewish people and atheists and people far outside of the Christian traditions to begin with. And so in the absence of a unifying moral vernacular, um, it is hard for us to transcend the subjective orientation of our traditions, even if we want to. And that, too, is part of the challenge in America. And so part of what I try to do is arrive at a way of speaking that can accomplish that. The more I learn about the values from which the American people and all of our diversity uh, proceed. And so, you know, I appreciate you for recognizing that. Thank you so much. So I'm conducting this interview on... Uh, well, it's it's uh, the fifth of July here, but I think it might still be the fourth of July where you. It are. is Independence is that, Day. Is that is that is right. Yeah, I don't think I'm going to be able to go to any firework shows after all, unfortunately. But, <laughs> oh, but that's okay. Really I've sad. I've been hearing people light off bottle rockets in my neighborhood for the last two days. So you know, patriotism is <laughs> <laughs> overflowing. I guess. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well. Um, I, I mean, this interview won't come out for a couple of weeks, but uh, nevertheless, um, we did hold it on 4th of July, and I think that was very appropriate. I think you're a marvelous model for um, what Americans can be mm. and uh, a representative of the best of America. And it's been, uh, as always, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you, John. Thank you so much. Likewise. Thank you, Iona. <laughs>